Okay, Calvin. Okay. Let's go to the throne. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you on this Sunday morning. I want to say thank you first for just waking us up, making it possible, Father God, to be on this virtual call as we are sharing your word today, uh, the bread of life, Lord God, that you feed our spirit, warm our hearts, and clear our minds, Father God. Uh, we pray, Father God, uh, for those, Lord God, uh, that hadn't seen a, 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 a good or a great or a better day, but we pray for their families. We pray for Jackie Roberts, uh, since son uh, who was victimized by a drive-by. Uh, Lawrence Willie, we pray for that family. We pray, Father God, this morning for all the moms, the mothers, the, the Medeas, the, the virtuous women, the mothers uh, of the church, the ladies in our community. We pray for this morning, Father God, for the church, the assembly of the saints, Lord God. We pray, Father God, this morning saying, bless this word, Father God, that it cuts through the bone, the marrow, Lord God. Uh, transforming us from the inside out, Lord God, that we would be better people, Lord, that we would uh, be light and salt to a world that's dark and unsavory, Lord God. We are in difficult times, Father, but we know that we can do all things through Christ. And we thank you for this lesson this morning as we continue our study on the church, Lord God. So reveal to us, Lord God, your truths, Lord God, that we can convey to others what we have learned today. We thank you for the teachers. We thank you for the classmates and everybody else that's instrumental to make this possible on this on this Sunday morning. So be thou glorified in the heavens and the earth and in this spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, so our lesson today is God arrests Saul and Peter's miracle ministry. We'll see uh, there are four meetings that transform Saul's life. In a previous lesson, uh, we saw the first meeting with Jesus Christ, where he met Jesus Christ. Last week, uh, we saw God arrest Saul, and, there, and that, that gave us the second meeting where we saw Saul and he met Ananias. Third, in the third meeting, we saw Saul meeting opposition. And then this week, we will see the fourth meeting where he met the Jerusalem believers. And then we will change the scene to uh, Peter's miracle ministry. And we'll see greater miracle, uh, a greater miracle where we'll see uh, Peter healing, and also a miracle of him raising uh, the dead. Okay. First, we'll have Ella to read our lesson text. Saul met the Jerusalem believers. And it's right here on the screen. Ella. Let's see if she's muted. I just unmuted. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. I start reading now. Yes, please. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the disciples and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how the Damascus, he spoken out bodily in the name of Jesus. And he was with them and he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking with ang arguing with Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to mm, Caesarea, Caesarea. Mm -hmm. Caesarea. Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace 
being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Amen. Thank you, Ella. Thank you. Okay. So next we'll have Bet Betty to read our commentary. They were, he met the Jerusalem believers. There were two stages in Saul's experience with the church in Jerusalem. Saul rejected and Saul accepted. First, Saul rejected. At first, the believers in Jerusalem's church were afraid. Sorry. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay, we're afraid of him. Saul kept trying to get into their fellowship, but they would not accept him. For one thing, they were afraid of him and probably thought that his new attitude of friendliness was only a trick to get them into their fellowship, to get into their fellowship so he could have them arrested. They did not believe that he was even a disciple of Jesus Christ, let alone an apostle who had seen the risen savior. Their attitude seemed strange to us for surely the Damascus saints had gotten word to the church in Jerusalem that Saul had been converted and was now preaching the word. Perhaps Saul's disappearance for almost three years gave an air of suspicion to his testimony. Where had he been? What was he doing? Why had he waited so long to contact the Jerusalem elders? Furthermore, what right did he have to call himself an apostle when he had not been selected by Jesus Christ? There were many unanswered questions that helped create an atmosphere of suspicion and fear. Saul accepted. It was Barnabas who helped the Jerusalem church accept Saul. He met Joseph, the son of encouragement in, in Acts 4, 36, 37. And we will meet him again as we continue to study Acts. Barnabas took hold of Saul, brought him to the church leaders and convinced them that Saul was both a believer and a chosen apostle. He had indeed seen the risen Christ. It is not necessary to invent some hidden reason why Barnabas befriended Saul. This was just the nature of the man. He was an encouragement to others. There seems to be a contradiction between Acts 9.27 and Galatians 1.18 through 19. How could Barnabas introduce Saul to the apostles if Peter was the only apostle Saul met? Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke is obviously using the word apostle in the wider sense of spiritual leader. Even Galatians called James the brother of the Lord, an apostle, and Barnabas is called an apostle in Acts 14, 4 and 14. In his epistle, Paul sometimes used apostle to designate a special messenger or agent of the church. So there really is no contradiction it is the leaders of the Jerusalem church that met that Saul met. Saul began to witness to the Greek speaking Jews. The Hellenistics, they had engineered the trial and death of Stephen. Saul was one of them, having been born and raised in, Tar raised in Tarsus. And no doubt he felt an obligation to take up the mantle left by Stephen. The Hellenistic Jews were not about to permit this kind of witness, so they plotted to kill him. At this point, we must read Acts 22, 17 through 21. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, hurry, 
and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used the imprison and beat those I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing nearby and approving and watching over the cloaks of those who were killing him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. God spoke to Saul in the temple and reminded him of his commission to take the message to the Gentiles. Note the urgency of God's command, quick, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Saul shared his message with the church leaders and they assisted him in returning to his native city, Tarsus. The fact that they believe Saul's testimony about the vision is proof that he had been fully accepted by the church. We will not meet Saul again until Acts 11.25, when once more it is Barnabas who finds him and brings him to the church at Antioch where they ministered together. They took place, that took place about seven years after Saul left Jerusalem, about 10 years after his conversion. We have every reason to, gotta lift the screen. Well, but to believe that Saul used Tarsus as his headquarters for, for taking the gospel to the Gentiles in the part of the Roman Empire. He ministered in the regions of Syria and Cilicia and established a church there. Some Bible scholars believe that the Galatian churches were founded at this time. It is likely that some of the trials listed uh, occurred during this period. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent adrift at sea. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, and dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. Only one Roman beating is recorded in Acts 16.22, which leaves two not accounted for. Likewise, the five Jewish beatings are not recorded either in Acts or the epistles. Luke tells us about only one shipwreck, but we have no record of the other two. Anyone who thinks that the apostle was taking a vacation during those years is certainly in error. Acts 9.31 is another of Luke's summaries that he regularly dropped into the book. And the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day. Note that the geographic locations parallel those given in Acts 1 and 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Luke is telling us that the message was going out just as the Lord had commanded. Soon the center would be Antioch, not Jerusalem, and the key leader, Paul, not Peter, and the gospel would be taken to the uttermost part of the earth. Raise the screen. Yes. It was a time of peace for the churches, but not a time of complacency, for they grew both spiritually and numerically. They seized the opportunity to repair and strengthen their sails before the next storm began to blow. Now, it is not the time to sit back and be content with our working for the Lord. 
after the sila reflections and a me mediation, it is time to get to work. Mm -hmm. uh, what to do and how to do are clearly spoken in the word. The door of faith had been opened to the Jews and to the Sumerians, and soon it would be open to the Gentiles. Saul had moved off the scene and Peter now returns. Soon Peter would move off the scene, except for a brief mention in Acts 15 and Paul will fill the pages of the books, book of Acts. God changes his workmen, but his work goes on. And you and I are privileged to be a part of that work today. Okay, Peter thank Atlanta. you, Betty. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Okay, so next, this should read life lesson. And Verna, you will read that. Okay, lesson or life lesson. Life, life lesson. Changing a reputation is difficult. And Saul had a terrible reputation with the Christians. But Barnabas, a Jewish convert, uh, mentioned in Acts 4.36, became the bridge between Saul and the apostles. New Christians, especially those with tarnished reputations, need us Christ followers to disciple and mentor them. God expects us to serve by being people who will come alongside new believers to encourage and teach them while introducing them to other believers instead of criticizing and judging them. Action, why, it is, why is it so difficult for us to do for others what Barnabas did for Saul? In what ways can you become like Barnabas to the new believers in your community? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now um, Peter's ministry and the uh, a lesson tech will, will be read by D. Okay, the healing ministry. Or did you want me to read the top also or just? Yes, yes, okay. that's fine, that's fine. The healing ministry. When he gave his hand and lifted her up and when he had called the saints and widows, he kind of hard to see presented, presented her, her alive. alive uh the result was the same in both cases they glorified god they turned to the lord they were overcome with great amazement and many believers many believed on the lord when we fully allow god to use us for the gospel's cause great things happen Acts 9, 32, 43. Now Peter was traveling through those regions and he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. To the folks who lived at Lydda. Lydda. There he found a man, he found a man named Antias. Aeneas. Mm -hmm. Who lived, who had been bedridden bedridden eight years for he was paralyzed. Peter said to Annius, Jesus Christ healed you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up. And all who lived in Landa and Shana saw him and they turned to the it has to be advanced. To the Lord. To the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. Okay, and then Robin. Robin, you will read uh, Peter's Miracle Ministry. Peter's Miracle Ministry. What is the greatest miracle that God can do for us. Some will call the healing of the body God's greatest miracle. 
while others will vote for the raising of the dead. However, I think that the greatest miracle of all is the salvation of a lost sinner. Why? Because salvation costs the greatest price. It produces the greatest results and it brings the greatest glory to God. In this section, we find Peter participating in all three miracles. He heals Ananias, he raises Dorcas from the dead, and he brings the message of salvation to Cornelius and his household. Thank you. And then the, um, the map. Lighter known in the Old Testament as Lode was located about 10 miles southeast of the seacoast city of Joppa. It was an important place since the roads from Egypt to Syria and from Joppa to Jerusalem passed through it. Today, it is the location of Israel's international airport. Peter was last mentioned in 825 when he was returning to Jerusalem from Samaria with John. Peter was involved in a traveling mission around Judea, which brought him to Lydda. Lydda, mentioned only here in the New Testament, is today called Lod, Lod. Israel's international airport is just north of the city. Peter Larry later carried on an extensive traveling ministry evident from 1 Corinthians 9.5. This is also implied from the addresses of, the, of his first epistle, 1 Peter 1.11, 1 and 1. One and one. Mm -hmm. Philip had preceded Peter to the area in and around Caesarea. The miraculous healing of Ananias, a paralytic. Aeneas. Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years, was the occasion intended for many to come to faith in Christ. Three times in Acts, Luke used the words to turn, turn to the, I can't see the rest. Three times in Acts, Luke used the words turn to the Lord to refer to salvation. The gospel was being to attract was beginning to attract a wider audience for many in this, in this coastal region were Gentiles. Sharon is the fertile plain along the coast of Palestine, about 10 miles wide and 50 miles wide, 50 miles long. Lida was on the southeastern edge of the plain. This miracle was Peter's second healing of a cripple. A All great right. thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and next, uh, Linda Gibson will read a miracle, a great miracle, and also the life lesson. Great miracle, healing the body, Acts 9, 32 through 35. The apostle Peter had been engaged in a traveling ministry when he found himself visiting the saints of Lydda, a largely Gentile city about 25 miles from Jerusalem. It is possible that the area had first been evangelized by people converted at Pentecost, or perhaps by faithful believers who had been scattered far and wide during the great persecution. No doubt Philip the evangelist had also ministered there. We know very little about Ananias. How old was he? Did he believe on Jesus Christ? Was he a Jew or a Gentile? All that Dr. Dr. Luke tells us, tells us in the, I need you to advance it. Tells us in, tells us in, tells us in the man had been palsied for eight years which meant he was crippled and helpless. He was a burden to himself and a burden to others. And there was no prospect that he would ever get healed, get well. Peter's first miracle had been the healing of a crippled man. And now that miracle was repeated. As you read the book of Acts, you will see 
parallels between the ministries of Peter and Paul. Both healed cripples, both were arrested and put into jail and were miraculously delivered. Both were treated like gods and both gave a bold witness before the authorities. Both had to confront false prophets. No one reading the book of Acts could end up saying, I am for Paul or I am for Peter, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. The resurrected Christ by the authority of his name brought perfect soundness to Aeneas. The healing was instantaneous and the man was able to get up and make his bed. He became a walking miracle. Acts 9.35 does not suggest that the entire population of Lydda and Sharon were saved, but only those who had contact with Ananias. Just seeking him, just seeing him walk around convinced them that Jesus was alive and they needed to trust him. See John 12, 10, 11 for a similar instance. You can be sure that Peter did not did much more in Lydda than heal Aeneas, as great and helpful as the miracle was. He evangelized, taught, and encouraged the believers and sought to establish the church in the faith. Jesus had commissioned Peter to care for the sheep, and Peter was faithful to fulfill that commission. Be and then be. Read the life lesson. Life lesson. Those actively involved in ministry, those actively involved in ministry are usually the ones to whom God grants the most ministry opportunities. God has always seemed to entrust his richest ministries to the most committed saints. Just being wholeheartedly active in ministry places one in a strategic opportunity and strategic opportunities. Peter's availability because he was involved gave him an open door for ministry. The miracle, besides its obvious impact in the life of Aeneas, was to be used by God to bring large numbers of people in the surrounding region to faith in Jesus Christ. Action. We can look back at Acts 6, 1 and 8, where we see the seven chosen deacons. They were available in that, in that they were willing to serve. Being available means being willing to adjust our own schedules, agendas, and plans so that it fits into the right desires of God and others. It means to be willing to make personal priorities secondary to the needs of God and others so we are always available to God and others. We should ask ourselves, what changes do I need to make to be available to God and others in my daily walk with God? Thank you, Linda. Okay, and then a greater miracle will be read by Estella. Estella Baker. Sorry, I was on mute, but I'm sorry. A greater, okay, the lesson text. A greater miracle rising, raising the dead. Acts 9, 36 to 43. Now, can you bring it down a little lower? Okay. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in the Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and clarity which she continually did, charity, which she continually did. And it happened at the time that she went sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since uh, Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, since, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room and all the windows stood beside him and all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing all the 
tight. Mm. Uh, all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And, she, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. And calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Thank you, Estella. Okay, and a greater miracle commentary, uh, 9, 36 to 43. Mark, you will read that. Let me advance the screen first. Okay. Mark, are you on mute? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, a greater miracle, raising the dead, Acts 9, 36 to 43. Joppa, the modern Joppa, is located on the seacoast, some 10 miles beyond Lydda. The city is an important Bible history as the place from which the prophet Jonah embarked when he tried to flee from God. Jonah went to Joppa to avoid going to, to the Gentiles. But Peter and Joppa received his call to go to the Gentiles. Because Jonah disobeyed God, the Lord sent a storm that caused the Gentile sailors to fear. Because Peter obeyed the Lord, God sent the wind of the spirit to the Gentiles and they experienced a great joy and peace. What a contrast. It seems so tragic that a useful and beloved saint like Dorcas should die when she was so greatly needed by the church. This often happens in local churches and it is hard. It is a hard blow to take. In our own pastoral ministry, I have experienced the loss of choice saints who were difficult to replace in the church. Yet all we can say is the Lord gave and Lord have taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The believers in Joppa heard the, that Peter was in the area and they sent for him immediately. There is no record in Acts that any of the apostles had raised the dead. So their sitting for Peter was an evidence of their faith in the power of the risen Christ. When our Lord ministered on earth, he raised the dead. So why he not be able to raise the dead from his exalted throne in glory? We usually think of the apostles as leaders who told other people what to do, but often the people commanded them. Peter was a leader who served the people and was ready to respond to their call. Peter had the power to heal and he used the power to glorify God and help people, not to promote himself. It was a Jewish custom first to wash the dead and then to anoint it with spices for burial. When Peter arrived in the upper room where Dorcas lay in state, he found a group of weeping widows who had been helped by her ministry. Keep in mind, there was no government aid in those days for either widows or orphans, and needy people had to depend on their network for assistance. The church has an obligation to help people who are truly in need. The account of Peter raising Dorcas should be compared, compared with the account for our Lord's raising of Jairus' daughter. In both cases, the morning were put out of their room. The, the morning people were put out of the room and the words spoken are almost identical. Talitha Kume, little girl arise. Tabitha Kume, Tabitha arise. Jesus took the girl by the hand before he spoke to her for he was not afraid of becoming ceremonial defiled. And Peter took Dorcas by the hand after she had come to life. In both instances, it was the power of God that raised the person from the dead. For the dead person certainly could not exercise faith. As with the healing of Aeneas, the raising of Dorcas attracted great attention 
and resulted in many trusting Jesus Christ. During the many days that he tarried in Joppa, Peter took the opportunity to ground these new believers in the truth of the word, for faith built on miracles alone is not substantial. It was a good thing Peter tarried in Joppa because God met with him there in a thrilling new way. God's servant needs not always to be on the go. They should take time to be along with God, to reflect and meditate and pray, especially after experiencing great blessings. Yes, there were plenty of sick people Peter might have visited and healed, but God had other plans and he delivered, deliberately detained his service in Joppa to prepare for his third use of the keys. It is significant that Peter stayed in the home of the tanner because tanners were considered unclean by the Jewish rabbis. God was moving Peter a step at a time from Jewish legalism into the freedom of his wonderful grace. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Okay, and then life lesson, the life lesson will be read by Robin Jones. Life lesson, tragedy struck the church at nearby Joppa when one of the most beloved members, a disciple named Tabitha, more commonly known by her Greek name of Dorcas, both names mean gazelle. The inscription on this lovely lady was that this woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. Specifically, as verse 39 shows, she made clothes for the poor and needy. The poor depended on her gifts. In contrast to Aeneas, she is specifically called a disciple. Mathetria, disciple, the feminine form of Mathetes, disciple, appears only here in the New Testament. Dorcas was certainly an appropriate model for what a Christian woman should be. Tabitha fulfilled her calling as a disciple, as described by Paul in Ephesians and Colossians. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And Colossians 1.10, that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. She was a New Testament example of a Proverbs 31 woman, one who extends her hand to the poor and stretches out her hands to the needy. Tabitha made an enormous impact on her community by always doing good and helping the poor and making robes and other clothing for people she knew. When she died, the room was filled with mourners, including many of the people she had helped. And when she was brought back to life, the news raced through the town. God uses great preachers like Peter and Paul, and he also uses those who have gifts of kindness like Tabitha. Rather than wishing we had other gifts, we should make good use of the gifts God has already given us. Action, what impact are you making in the body of Christ? Will your community experience a lack and the needy suffer in the need as a result of your passing? Thank you, Robin. Okay, and that concludes our lesson. Uh, next week, we will look at the greatest miracle and winning winning the loss uh and that comes from acts 10. so now we can no not yet we can start now yes and deborah uh wants the recording to start it will cue you started okay deborah okay father god we come boldly and fearlessly and humbly before your throne today. And we're thanking you, oh God, for protecting us in every way, for providing for us in every way. We thank you, Lord God, for this awesome lesson about Paul and Peter and Jonah and Tabitha and all of the examples that you set before us in your word, Lord God, so that we are not confused, 
but that by listening and reading and studying their uh, lives and what they went through, we know exactly how to approach persecution and obstacles that are in our way. Father God, we have been confined for a long time, most of us, and some of us are experiencing emotional and, and, and psychological issues, oh God, fear and doubt and unsurety about our futures. But Lord God, you are our God and you are in control and you have kept all this time. You will not fail us, oh God. Your ministering angels surround us and minister to us moment by moment. We trust you, Lord. We don't lean to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, oh God, we acknowledge you. Lord God, we, we take this message that you've given us, oh God, uh, of perseverance and endurance through trials because we know that Paul suffered. And Lord God, we have suffered, but I don't think any of our problems have been as, as bad as Paul went through. And yet he said, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. So even no matter what we're going through right now, Lord God, we will rejoice. God, you caused him to make great change and transition in the kingdom of God. And we're counting on you to, to do the same thing with us because we're going to make ourselves available today to whatever it is your will is, oh God, we will promptly obey. We commit today to promptly and quickly obey and fully obey. We will not be weary, O oh God, in well-doing, because we know that we will reap if we faint not. Thank you for the crucifixion. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for our greatest reward is with you in heaven, as long as we stay on the path of righteousness. Clothe us, O oh God, in the full honor of God each day. Father God, I pray that we as we lift up all those who are sick, all those who have uh, uh, been hospitalized. My, my friend called me this morning and told me, oh God, that her mother was given a diagnosis this morning <clears throat> of metastatic cancer and she has only a few weeks to live. And Lord God, what a, what a diagnosis to get on Mother's Day, on any day but especially on Mother's Day. Father God, comfort all those who are ill, comfort all those who are struggling with sickness and disease. We bind up every, every fiery dart of the enemy that he's throwing at us right now, Lord God. And we loose, Lord God, the power of your healing, oh Lord. You are a mighty God and you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think. I pray especially, Lord God, for those who just lost their mothers. I lost my mother and I lost my child. Mother's Day has always been a tough day for me. But Lord, I lift up my eyes and look to the hills from which I help. My help comes from you, oh God. And even though I lost my loved ones, oh God, I still have Jesus. We still mm -hmm. have Jesus. So, Lord God, we have all that we need. As long as we got your son, Lord, we have everything that we need. Bless each and every one of my Salem family members, oh God. Bless my Sunday school teachers and preachers. And bless our pastor and, and Jamel, oh God. Bless their family, oh God, and keep them in your perfect care. Continue to, to be the good, good shepherd that you are guarding over us, guiding us, counseling us, providing for us, oh God, and keeping us in, in Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 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 Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Amen. Amen.